Today I'll be reading Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thank you, Eduardo. Well, it's great to see everybody today. You guys do sound great when you sing. Good job, Gabby, leading and... It's great to be able to be at this time of the year. There's lots of good things coming up. This week is actually when we're going to begin the special series on Wednesday night. And so there's going to be, going to be a time when we learn actually more new songs and, and kind of fix some of the ones that we have been. So you get some very professional leaders to help you in your singing. So if you come Wednesday night, we'll be in the fellowship hall and, and they will all be there and they do an excellent job. If you hate to sing, come anyway. Uh, Ashby will be in the auditorium and he will be talking about angels and demons and all kinds of things after this life. And he will explain everything you ever wanted to know about those. And so that's gonna be a great class as well. And on top of that, if you come at 5.30, there's dinner. It's like a $3 donation, but I mean, it's a whole lot better dinner than that. So if you wanna come and take part in that, we will quit serving, so don't come at five minutes till seven and think, okay, I'm going to get in on dinner. No. So if you're not here before 6.30, you're out of luck. So bring your own. No. Just be here early enough, okay? And so it's going to be a good thing. Joshua has things planned for kids upstairs, and so this is going to be an exciting week. And and this makes up for it being hot outside because there's going to be lots of exciting things going on here. All right. I want to talk to you about shame a little bit. And this is not something we usually talk about. And this is not a passage we usually talk about. But I want you to look at what it says and, and let's try and unpack this whole thing and figure it out. So part of this is about salvation, about what that means, and part of this is about where it talks about shame. As you look at Paul, he's writing to the Jews, and he writes to the Jews because normal for them was a righteousness based on law. And so when they did the right things, and when they kept the law, and they followed the commandments of God, then they were doing what God expected. It didn't really matter how they felt, as long as they did what was right. And it wasn't so much the feeling that they had is, did you offer the sacrifice? Did you do it at the right time? Did you stay away from things? Did you do all the good things? And if you did, you were acceptable to God because it was very much based on this law and this performance. That messes with a lot of us today because the law and the standard is set so high among ourselves that we can't reach it, so we want to give up. And it's no longer the standard of God. It seems to be the standard of what church people think. And it's the standard of what the world thinks around this. And they almost put things on to church people because church people never said that, but they want to make us into more hypocrites than, they, than we already are. I'm not saying we aren't. But they want to make it worse than we already are. And so then the whole situation becomes impossible. I think this passage speaks to all of those things. Because here Paul talks about a righteousness based on faith. It is not a righteousness based on performance. It is not a righteousness based on law. And of course that means faith in Jesus. So what does righteousness based on faith look like? It looks very different than what they had. Because here he talks about if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And so this isn't just a mental thing that says, well, I believe Jesus might be Lord somewhere. Or that we might give him the title of Lord. I think here he is saying, if you confess with your mouth, 
that you are taking Jesus as your Lord. And so I think that's more the intent of this because this is a very personal passage. If you say it out loud, if it's not just whispered under your breath and say, well, I might think that. No, if you actually say to somebody, if you confess, I believe Jesus is my Lord of my life. And if you're willing to go that far, it is a statement of faith about what you believe. And so here he talks about there is no one greater, that he is the Lord in your life, that he is master over you. And so you're going to understand and take that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord. The second part of this, if we believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Well, that's not just a mental assent either, that, well, I think it might be possible that sometime, somewhere, Jesus could have done this. No, I believe that is a truth for my life. And that Jesus was actually raised from the dead, not just, you know, well, we don't know where we went and we're not quite sure. But that we have come to the conclusion that is the one thing that is absolutely true. And we are willing to make that confession and that belief in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead. And all, all, everything along with that, that if he was raised from the dead that he also died, and he died because of our sin, and so he died because of our sin, and he took our place on that cross, and he was raised from the dead, and we believe that applies to us as well. This is all salvation stuff, and we are believing and confessing with the heart man believes and is justified, with the mouth he confesses, and we are saved, and so this passage really makes Church of Christ people uncomfortable, doesn't it? I mean, we kind of squirm a little bit and go, I don't know what to do this. Please don't let anyone ever take this passage away from you. This is a great passage, and I want to be able to unpack what this really looks like. As the scripture says, and this is part of it when we're beginning to look at this, as the scripture says, Everyone who believes is not put to shame. What does he mean by that? Everyone who believes is not put to shame. The rest of it is Church of Christ stuff. I mean, it's basic salvation stuff. It's what we know all the time. Something about confessing and Jesus rising from the dead and our faith and, and knowing in our heart that he's Lord and all of those things are what we normally encounter. But here he says, you will not be put to shame. And I think in our world, we don't know how to deal with shame very well. In fact, we almost did, are afraid to admit it even exists or that it's even part of us. And so what does that really talk about? Well, I think the law of Moses brought a lot of shame. Because if you couldn't measure up to the law, well, then you're worthless. And you see even Jesus' treatment of some people. Lepers are left outside of a city because they're not allowed to go in. Why? Because you aren't good people. You've got something wrong with you. Well, how can you not feel some shame if you're a leper or if you're a blind man? And your main job, the only way for you to make any kind of living whatsoever, is for you to sit and beg. Does that play into shame a little bit? Well, it was kind of normal from them. They accepted us. It accepted it as being something normal, right? Do we accept that? Or when the woman who's Canaanite comes to him and asks for her daughter to be healed, and Jesus says, we don't give dogs crumbs. Really? Does shame play into that a little bit? Is that describing what their culture was like? And the law generally brings shame. So let me share with you some things that I think shame is doing in our society today. Shame is the intensely painful feeling that we are unworthy of love. It's a fear of disconnection. It's a fear that I'm not good enough. It's a fear that I don't measure up. It leads to depression. It leads to feeling worthless. It's not trying because it's just too hard and I just can't do it and people expect too much and it's too embarrassing. And 
You know how it is when you're bad at everything. You might as well just be bad at everything and not even try. And so we have a lot of people, and you may recognize that kind of thing that we do. People see themselves as trash. In fact, they're referred to as trash. You've heard of white trash. I mean, we can't dare call anyone else trash, right? It's only white trash. But it really goes for everything. So they are homeless because they have nowhere to go. Does that play into shame? They're jobless because no one will believe in them enough to hire them. They're trash. They have no skill. They never completed their education. They're not useful and no one cares. And they become addicts or prostitutes. And they take whatever they can get because no one will give them a break. And they're bitter at the whole world because they are the outcasts. And their number is growing and growing and growing. You see them everywhere now. With signs on the streets. And maybe sitting next to you in a restaurant if they can get there. But their shame is still there. Because they do not feel worthy of love or of anything of attention and no one seems to care about them and so rather than risk that and say well I'm here they're going to reject everybody else first and they're going to say I don't have anything that you would want and so I don't care about you first I might as well just sit home and play video games at least I can lose at that Because no one wins at that. But at least you get another life, right? So what does it mean to be healthy? Well, healthy is a sense of worthiness. A sense of loving and belonging. And a sense that you deserve to be loved. And that you feel like that that's part of where you are. That you're worthy of love and of belonging. And that people would treat you that way and you would expect that they would do that and you don't let somebody else abuse you because you believe that there's good and you believe that they do matter the other people seem to get so much abuse so what do the people have in common who believe that they're worthy and by the way that is the difference between the two those people who are completely overtaken by shame and those people who somehow have managed to feel like they are worthwhile is they feel worthy of love, worthy of someone caring about them, and they wouldn't put up with somebody not caring about them. And the others would do anything and let themselves be seen in any kind of awkward, horrible position because After all, I'm not worthy of anything anyway. Why would I care? At least it gets ratings on YouTube, right? When you can show just how depraved we can possibly be. But the people who are worthy have these things in common. They have courage. And by courage, I mean that they're able to be imperfect. They're able to say, I'm imperfect. I don't do everything right. And that takes real courage just to be able to say that, you know what, I make a lot of mistakes. And you'll tell who you are with your whole heart. They have compassion, but they're kind to themselves first. They realize I am worthy of some kind of kindness. It's not that I give it all away to everybody else, but I would give myself some grace as well as give it to other people. It isn't that everyone is unworthy. And they feel some kind of connection where they can be authentic, where they can be real, where they can actually say, this is who I am and this is what I care about. And they are excruciatingly vulnerable. And that seems to be the difference. So how do we solve it? We need a different mindset. Not a mindset that says, well, who cares? Who's going to make any difference in this? Why would it matter? I might as well go where the money is. 
I might as go with what makes me feel good. And so then we would go with all kinds of things that are very degrading to us. Because we no longer have a standard about who we live with or who we sleep with or what we take or what we would do or how depraved we can be. But some things are worth fighting for on principle. That we need to believe that we can make a difference, that we matter, that we can save others, that they matter. We believe there is no one beyond the reach of the gospel. I saw this. This seems to define the feeling that needs to be there as much as anything else. It is not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumphs of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. So that is his place. He shall never be with those cold, timid souls who know neither defeat nor victory. It was Teddy Roosevelt who came up with the concept of daring greatly. That you would be vulnerable enough and believe in something enough that you would put it all on the line. That you would say it's worth it. That you're willing to try even if it doesn't look like you're going to make it, and even if you fails before, that you're willing to say, I love you first. Not waiting for someone else. You're willing to invest in relationships that may not work out. And yes, you will be hurt, but it might just be worth it. Not trying to control or trying to be predictable or not trying to predict other people. You're just trying to be vulnerable. Because vulnerability is the birthplace of joy and of love and of happiness. Brene Brown has done a lot of research and study into this. And so a lot of things I'm drawing from her, you'll see her name on the bottom. A lot of these things, that's probably hard to read. Daring greatly means the courage to be vulnerable. It means to show up and be seen, to ask for what you need to talk about how, you f how you're feeling, to have the hard conversations. It's one of those things that's hard. We become numb sometimes because I don't want to be rejected anymore. I don't want to hurt anymore. And I don't want somebody to tell me that's a dumb idea. I don't know what somebody else to say this is no good. And we feel rejected and we hate it. And so we become numb. We just numb all of our emotions because I'm not going to let anybody hurt me anymore there. And so I've been turned down by everybody and everything on every idea. And it just seems like there's nowhere you can turn where anybody cares. Well, if they can't reject, they can't reject me if I don't, if they don't, if I don't care. I mean, they can say whatever and I don't care. And that's become our first words out of our minds. I don't care. Why should I care? doesn't matter to me. I don't care. It's really hard to build relationships with I don't care. And the trouble with being numb, while it does work for us, that people will not hurt us as much anymore, but you cannot selectively numb one emotion. You numb them all. And so we numb joy, and we numb happiness, and we numb meaning, and we numb love so that we don't feel anymore because we don't want to be hurt. 
And as a result, we can't be happy. We try to make the uncertain certain, and we can't. So we blame somebody else, right? Um, Blame is just a way to try to discharge some kind of pain and discharge our comfort, our discomfort. We believe we have to be perfect. And so we make a list of all the good things that good people do, and it's, you know, like having a law to go by, a standard. This is what's expected, and we never live up to it. We always fail, and we aren't perfect. We are worthless. Only perfect is acceptable. And sometimes we believe that. Our body image is terrible. So we work out, and we diet, and we suck out fat, and we tuck in here, and we wrap ourselves in seaweed or whatever else we can find to be able to say, well, I'm going to look better then, rather than just saying, I'm this age and I'm in this shape, and it's caused me to get here and I am fine. I accept where I am. The job isn't to say that you aren't perfect, but that you are wired for love and belonging. And it has nothing to do with being perfect. We let ourselves be seen, even when there's no guarantee that we will be accepted. We love with our whole heart. We become vulnerable. To practice love, to practice joy, we can say to ourselves, I am enough. And we stop screaming and we start listening. Vulnerability is not weakness. It is emotional risk with uncertainty. It is the most accurate definition of courage because you never saw anyone who was courageous who did not risk, who did not make himself vulnerable at some point. It is the birthplace of creativity, of innovation, and of change. Creativity does not exist without being open. It always takes risk. And secondly, we need to be able to talk about shame. We have to connect with the people around us. 99% of the criticism that we have comes from us. We are our own worst critic. And shame is saying, I am bad. Guilt is saying, I did something wrong. Shame is saying, I am wrong. And for God to come in and say, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame is incredible. Shame's organized by gender. Women will try to do everything perfectly. There was a commercial not too long ago about the woman who's able to do everything. She can cook up the bacon. She can clean the house. She can do her job. She can do everything. And it's all perfect because I'm woman, right? And if you don't live up to that, what does that make? You can't be perfect. And shame is when we're unable to be who we think we're supposed to be. You shouldn't expect yourself to be there. That's not the right place. Men, shame is being weak. I don't want to appear weak. So I don't want to admit I ever do anything wrong. I mean, everybody can already know that, but I just don't want to admit that I ever do anything wrong because I don't ever want to, I don't want to ever appear to be weak. As long as I appear to be strong, that makes all the difference. And shame grows in secrecy, in silence, and in judgment. The passage in Romans says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And there are so many passages in the Bible when you start looking and searching and and finding those words where it says you will not be put to shame. 
He says, there is nothing about you that is going to be shameful. There is nothing you could do. There is nothing you could think. No way that you could be that God is going to say, you're too shameful to come to me. And that I can't forgive that. That I won't put up with that. It's a promise of God. Because we are daring greatly. He says, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord over all. And he's bestowing riches on all who call on him. And then the last line is, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let me put this whole passage together for you. Because this one seems to always give us trouble. And it seems like we get to this passage and go, oh, that's those other people's scripture. Nah. Look at the passage. He talks about salvation here, and he does talk about it, and it is what Paul is trying to say. And we'll like Romans 6, but Romans 10, oh, let's stay away from that one. We just got to understand what he's trying to say. So what does he really mean? What does he mean about this? Well, he's talked about saved a, a couple of different times already, right? So when he talks about being saved, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord, if we believe in your heart that God raises him from the dead, you will be saved. It does say that. Please don't take away the black and white of what it says. But please also realize it says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There are not two things in this passage. There are three. So while we see the emphasis by a lot of people on the first two things, that third one we have to realize is part of the same paragraph, part of the same passage. And he did not intend to say you can confess and believe and, well, but this whole other, you know, calling on the name of the Lord, that doesn't really have to happen. There are three things in this passage. And so what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? That's, you know, sounds like a phone call. A text. There's got to be some kind of communication. And so we think about things like that. Maybe it has to do with this idea of confessing just Jesus as Lord or believing in your heart. And certainly that would, would fit in with this. It's confess, believe, and call. And so what does Paul mean by this? Well, let's go to another passage by Paul as he talks about his conversion and what he's really trying to say there in Acts 22 and verse 16 he says he's recounting to the emperor and he says and one Ananias a devout man according to the law well spoken by the law by all the Jews who lived there came to me and standing by me said to me brother Saul receive your sight and at that very hour I received my sight and I saw him and he said the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will to see the righteous one, to hear the voice of his mouth, for you will be a witness for him and to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And so Paul says, in my own conversion, what did calling on his name means as he writes chapter 10? He says, calling on the name of the Lord meant what I did when I was converted. It's when Ananias came to me, he healed my sight, and he told me about God. And he asked me what I was waiting for. He said, if you get up and you are baptized and it washes away your sins, that is calling on the name of the Lord. You see, it's mentioned three times in Scripture total. One is in Romans 10, the second one is here. And so he links it with the idea, the element of confession and belief are all there as well. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's risen from the dead and that he has overcome sin for us and that he would die for us. And we are worthy. We are not put to shame. And so we make a covenant by being baptized with him and that baptism washes away sin and we believe the righteousness of faith has come into our life the third one is in acts chapter 2 
Peter has been trying to tell them about the prophecy of Joel. The Spirit has been poured out, and since the Spirit has been poured out, you he, see the sound of, or you hear the sound of the rushing wind, you see the tongues of fire, and you're able to see what's going on. And then Peter begins to speak as he gives them the prophecy of Joel. And verse 21 is the end of the prophecy of Joel. It's Joel 2.32, and it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God you crucified and killed by the hand of lawless men. Raised, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And so Peter declares salvation early in his sermon. He says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. It's Acts 2. I mean, it's the beginning of the church. It's what we believe, right? Isn't Acts 2 one of our scriptures? But not verse 21. I mean, we don't want verse 21, do we? Why not? Take verse 21. That's exactly what it says. This is the prophecy. This is the fulfillment of what Joel said, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he goes on and he talks about Jesus and he talks about how easy this is. And he talks about, he describes what Jesus did. He describes his life and he convinces the people that you crucified the Christ it was Jesus, he was Messiah, he was the Christ, and that he died for you. And then they come back with their question, well, what do we do? And so if you look at Acts 2, 37, we're in our territory now. <laughs> and when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Told you, that's the question. And Peter said to them, I already told you, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. He's not changing his mind. It's not a difference in invitation. He says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And he says, well, I know, Peter, but if we're going to call on the name of the Lord, what do you mean by that? He says, well, what I mean is that you need to be able to call. But how do we do that? And so I want you to read the passage in Acts 2.37. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Notice the shame. They were cut to the heart because they have crucified the Son of God. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, how do we do this? What shall we do to get rid of our shame. And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children, for our, all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And when they heard this, they said, okay, I would do anything to get rid of the shame that I feel right now of having crucified Jesus. That somehow I am the one who made his death a necessity. And that he is the one who would do something like that for me. And the action it takes to call on the name of the Lord is confession that he is my Lord. And the action it takes to call on the name of the Lord is also believing that God raised him from the dead. And the action it takes to call on the name of the Lord is also this repentance and this baptism into Christ for the forgiveness of sin because it is the only way the Bible speaks about it. And when the Bible defines its own terms, you cannot give them different meaning. This is our book. This is our passage. What it means to call on the name of the Lord. That he might take away your shame. That he might take away your guilt. And you will receive the Holy Spirit. It happens at the same time 
We're born of water and spirit. That's John 3, and I already don't have time to explain all of that one. But we're believing that Jesus is raised from the dead. We're confessing he is my Lord, and we're making covenant with a God who says, I will take away your shame. And that makes salvation. Don't leave parts out. Nothing has transformed my life more than realizing it's all a waste of time to evaluate my worthiness by weighing the reaction of the people in the stands. It's always about God, isn't it? It's always about Him. And if He says we're okay, then we're okay. If he says we're okay, then we can live with that, right? It doesn't matter if everybody else condemns us and calls us stupid and thinks we are incompetent and can't do anything. The best thing we can do with that is admit it. That really takes away all their ammunition. Did you ever try that? Somebody goes, that's really stupid. You say, yeah, I know. Are you so ignorant? Yes, I really am. They just don't really have anywhere else to go with that. Are you so incompetent? I am really incompetent. You should realize that about me. That is me. I am completely incompetent. Well, then, then what do you say? Well, no, you're not that bad. <laughs> Finally, what I was looking for. <laughs> and I didn't have to be perfect to get it. So I want to ask you about your sin today. Because we all have it. Don't think you came here without it. But more than anything, I want to ask you about your shame today. Can you be open to God for how worthless you feel? And can you be open to Jesus about how important you are? And can you believe in him? Because it's a huge risk to take him as Lord, to confess. He died because I have sin. I am not perfect, but I am not worthless. Maybe we can help you with that today because that's all of us. If you want to come to God, come here. Because you're going to have lots of people around you who care. Would you come while we stand and sing?